it's an excellent question. Uh, some of them are self-limiting, some of them are not. So for example, if you have a larger, uh, let's take a case where you don't have an air gap. That was going to have some variability in terms of its loading and coupling because CDs are different, spaces are different, so you have some variability there. With an air gap, it can be thought of as self-compensating. So if you have a large space, you have a large uh, air gap, air gap doesn't fill as well, so it actually in, in, uh, increases your FGFG from that point of view. But your space was large to begin with, so your FGFG is low. So as an integrated picture, uh, the variability is not any worse than uh, what you would have without an air gap. The other next thing was uh, uh, oh no, uh, oxide nitride oxide. So I mentioned a while ago that you needed uh, something close to 120, 140 uh, angstroms in uh, physical layers, in physical thickness. So that's good. In a 90 nanometer flash, or 10 nanometer thickness of oh no on either side not a big deal, you can uh, tolerate it. But now scale it down to a 20 nanometer flash, I have 12 nanometers of ONO on each side. I don't have space to put a control gate in addition to an ONO there. So essentially I've just run out of space to put that dielectric there. I cannot uh, not have a wrap because then that really, really screws up my gate coupling ratio. And as a result, we are in a very tight box. So there isn't enough space to, uh, between the floating gates to actually accommodate the poly 2 and the ONO at a 20 nanometer node. Uh, and uh, a while ago we had said, no, uh, how can you still maintain your gate coupling ratios but not have a wrap? So here, this is what I call by a wrap. So you have a floating gate and you're wrapping it around with a control gate. No, go to a planar cell where the control gate really is completely planar. And in order to maintain the gate coupling ratio in such a scenario, you have to have something which has much higher A, dielectric constants, B, different barriers. So uh, uh, we thought about putting a high K dielectric in this particular one, and that would facilitate us going to a planar cell in this particular direction. Uh, the requirements of this high K are very different than what we uh, usually optimize for logic. Logic is all about mobility, uh, whereas here, I really don't care about mobility because there is no mobility happening between poly 1 and poly 2. But I do care a lot about leakage and at these high fields, these dielectric, we don't even look at these dielectrics in the logic case because we are talking about 1.8 or lower volts VDD, whereas we are, I'm still talking about 20 volts. Uh, so we put this thought into action. So uh, this is uh, what I think is a biggest change from what uh, technology graphs we've shown for a while. We have a fully planar uh, cell right now in production, uh, 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 which uses high K and gets away from these uh, wrap related issues. So uh, it's, uh, it's the first planar cell of its kind. It's the first cell which uses high K in a flash environment. And uh, as a result, we do have the smallest cell size in the whole industry. So, you mentioned uh, we are not the gorillas, yes, but technologically we are uh, leading uh, the pack in terms of innovations uh, as far as the uh, scaling is concerned. So uh, it, it is the best solution for 20 nanometers, and we strongly believe that it is a scalable solution beyond this also. So uh, we're very proud of this innovation that came from our group here. <coughs> uh, so talked about a few things, uh, air gap and planar high K cell. Uh, what about uh, the other things that I mentioned? Few electron effects. As the dimensions scale, the cell capacitance scales. So you have uh, less number of electrons stored per unit level. So every electron starts mattering more and more because it uh, has a very high impact in terms of VT, which is the domain we actually uh, determine ones and zeros with. And uh, that's a big problem. The channel area scales, and with the gate oxide not scaling, we have less number of uh, electrons in the channel as well. So I talked about less number of electrons in the floating gate. We also have less number of electrons in the channel. And again, if you have uh, uh, some interface states where electrons go in and out, you're going to have a large, uh, you're going to have 1 over f, which you always do. But then the impact of that is going to be very large. In addition to that, uh, you are talking about literally uh, uh, hundreds of angstroms of area, so random dopant fluctuations also becomes very 
very tricky. Um, just a few uh, uh, very good work from uh, now, now Micron, I guess, but uh, ST at that time. Uh, what they are showing is uh, as you, uh, the statistical distribution in number of injected electrons during programming uh, it actually introduces fluctuations in the cell. So I'm trying to go uh, put 100 electrons, but you're actually going to have a variability of num because of just number fluctuations. And this fluctuation, the impact of this fluctuations increases pretty significantly as the cell size uh, uh, scales down. Uh, something similar, uh, the channel electron trapping and detrapping uh, during read also causes the current to fluctuate. And this is essentially RTS. So this is a measurement I did nine years ago. You can actually start seeing the impact. And this impact scales pretty seriously as you go to smaller and smaller nodes. There are second order effects about uh, channeling and all that. But to the first order, RTS is a very uh, big problem. So uh, RTS is... Uh, random telegraph signal because it looks like that kind of a graph where you have a square wave going up and down. Uh, what it, uh, the uh, reason RT, you have, so how do I, what is this measurement all about? I'm measuring a drain current at a fixed voltage for a long amount of time, and that's this graph. So x-axis is time, y-axis is the drain current. Because of trapping and detrapping, of the electrons in the interface, you're going to have different uh, either VT or mobility or both uh, for the carriers in the channel, and that affects your drain current. So that's the reason my current is going up and down as a function of time. Now, uh, if I keep measuring for a long amount of time, I'm going to scan a whole bunch of traps at different energy depths, different spatial locations, different trap constants, different life constants, all that other, the whole variable. And I'm going to see larger and larger fluctuations as I measure it, sample it over larger and larger time. So that's the essence of RTS. Uh, and uh, now you, you can see that if, my, if I'm conducting 1,000 carriers and I have one trap or two traps, one electron is not going to have as much impact on the drain current. But if I'm, I'm conducting only 10 carriers, that one electron is going to have a significant amount of impact on my drain current, which is what determines ones and zeros. So that's why scaling makes the impact of RTS that much worse. And uh, not much you can do about it, especially if you want to have uh, cost scale savings by making things smaller. So this is just one cell. If I look at large number of cells, that's how I look at a whole bunch of uh, uh, energy depths, locations, all that stuff. And you can actually see the variation just keeps getting very large. Um, so this is an example of uh, a simulation by uh, a Japanese group. You can see that uh, what, what here I'm showing is statistics. So if a median cell doesn't really have too much RTS, but if you look at a large number of cells, you see that the noise amplitude, which is if you, I go to the earlier plot, the difference in the min and the max of this current just keeps getting larger and larger. And it's pretty proportional to somehow related to the area. There are second order effects where now uh, if one trapped electron can actually deplete the entire channel because you're talking about such a small, literally 200, 200 angstroms kind of a geometry, and that just increases the fluctuation of, uh, increases the impact of one electron being trapped. So the few electron effects, not much you can do about it because it's kind of fundamental. So uh, we, how do we go? forward from here. So we are at 20. We have a pretty innovative all air gaps, planar, high cave, all that. We can keep going for a while. But this is where a dramatically new approach comes in. So beyond planar cell, the NAND scaling will continue, but it will go in the vertical direction. So it will uh, look somewhere in the 3D NAND kind of a direction. So instead of uh, trying to make things smaller and smaller, just stack a whole bunch of things. So effectively, from a cell size area, you're actually getting a, a lot of improvements uh, uh, instead of trying to make things smaller and actually running into physical limits. A uh, lot of companies are spending a lot of uh, time and uh, uh, resources looking into these various 3D architectures. Uh, 
lot of lot of process integration details here. So I just give you a flavor of what uh, these uh, different companies are. So Toshiba is looking at something called pipe bit cost scalable architecture. Uh, Samsung is looking at TCAT. There is various acronyms essentially trying to differentiate their NAND technology, 3D technology <coughs> from uh, different people. At a device level or at a very high level, you can classify them in two ways. Either I'm conducting current in the vertical direction, which are the first three approaches from Toshiba, Samsung, and uh, uh, Hynix, I believe. Or I'm conducting current in the horizontal direction, which is a Macronics approach, which is very innovative, very different, and has its own trade-offs. So uh, those are the two cells. And then there are lots of variations that people are looking around it in terms of uh, how many layers can I stack? Can I even edge this thing? What is the aspect ratio needed? A uh, lot of, lot of uh, structure-related work and effort that uh, happens in this particular area. Uh, what it buys you? from a device point of view again, is uh, for a effectively small cell print, the physical cell size of this structure can be pretty large. So I'm still going to get all the bit saving, uh, cost savings as if I'm making a very strong cell, but that's because I'm amortizing it over a whole bunch of uh, layers, which are 16 or whatever else you want to make. Uh, this is the key breakthrough that will provide a lot of relief to the scaling issues caused uh, by these uh, few electron effects. Uh, but you can see that this is a uh, technology feed that gets to be uh, uh, fully perfected, and it's going to have its own challenges in terms of it's going to introduce more degradations, and it's going to have its own challenges. So um, it, it is going to be a, a challenge. One thing you'll notice is that uh, tunnel oxide, uh, in all these structures, one common theme is that tunnel oxide is usually uh, 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 grown on a polysilicon surface, and that itself sets you in a very, very different poor regime in terms of uh, reliability. So 3D will have its challenges, but that will be the uh, key breakthrough that will keep uh, scaling of NAND uh, going. Um, so that's pretty much all I had. Uh, so yes, flash memory is playing a very important role in the way we live and work, uh, from phones uh, to SSDs and every which way. Uh, this has been enabled through real continued technology scaling over the past years. The path ahead is more challenging than what we have come about. So we are already looking at pretty drastic material changes, and now we are looking at uh, structure changes. And it's much more uh, uh, challenging. And there are a large number of uh, possible technical paths that we can go ahead. I think that should answer your question, that we don't know the path. There are many options. But at a high level with the planar, followed by a 3D structure, we do see NAND scaling going on for several more generations. So yes, there is a red brick wall, but we keep pushing it further and further away in terms of uh, uh, limits. Uh, flash is, uh, see, it, power consumption depends on two things. One thing is uh, the density of the whole die and the actual uh, chip that you're, the cell scaling. With cell scaling, actually, power doesn't scale. What hurts you is because you're going to larger and larger page sizes. So you're trying to program more and more bytes in the same parallel operation. Those are the things that hurt you. But scaling facilitates you going to bigger die. And bigger die is always more is better because I can put more memory in your same real estate that you're giving me on an SSD. So that is the reason why power uh, actually in a uh, NAND die is going up. But nothing to do with the fundamental cell. It's to do with the die architecture that we are choosing. So yes, active power does go up, especially during programming. Programming is the limiter for power, uh, because you're essentially trying to take the entire word line to 20 volts, which is a lot of RC that you have to drive. Uh, and it scales because of page length and other effects, not as much as the intrinsic cell. Not a question that can be answered without lots of graphs, uh, but I can point you to a few papers. And they walk through the process flow pretty step by step. Essentially, it's a, a let's take this uh, first example. You're depositing a lot of stacks in one shot. You're breaking it up. That becomes your gate. And then you deposit your active conformally. And that becomes your actual uh, body. So that's a 30 second reply, but it's oversimplifying to a very large degree. Uh, 
the first question five companies are too many uh, yes and no uh, so we have what samsung toshiba micron intel hynix and other companies which are probably below in the sub 1% kind of uh, uh, maybe sub 5% kind of market cap so sandisk is, uh, sandisk is toshiba so essentially uh, they are together uh, Toshiba is essentially the foundry, it's not exa it's a full JDP, but the Toshiba means Toshiba plus Sandex, yes. Uh, each one of the company is very big. Each one of them is very highly vested in this kind of a cheap storage memory. And you can see that TAM is huge. So the carrot is there. People are not going to get rid of, I mean, not going to walk away from a 50 billion TAM. Uh, so I don't see anybody uh, from these key players really walking away because that is their core bread and butter. So uh, and everybody plays it to their own strengths. For example, uh, Intel Micron go with innovation. That's how we keep ahead of all the cost. We are in uh, literally in the US, so costs are higher, but we stay ahead with innovation in terms of everybody else. Samsung goes with scale. You can't beat them with that kind of a thing. Hynix goes with just plain simple cost. They are N minus two kind of technology, but they milk it to the point where the yields are so high that they still make money out of it. So everybody plays to their strength. So I don't think uh, uh, these big players are going anywhere uh, because of uh, just the that's their core bread and butter. They have the raw horsepower to go after it, and the market is big enough to actually be able to support that. So don't think uh, yes. Lesser would be better for the remaining few, but uh, uh, I don't think that's really going to happen. The second question was uh, uh, actually the question that you've posed is exactly the panel discussion topic uh, this December. Uh, Al is uh, coordinating that I'm defending NAND, so this is a good practice uh, for me. Uh, you are one of the yes, I am. Oh. Uh, so IDM. that's IDM this yeah. December. Yeah. Uh, so. To the first order, I mean, NAND is so mature that anybody wanting to displace NAND needs to grow. So there has to be a niche technology which has to really get foothold, which has to, um, it has to prove itself and then start growing. So we are, I think we are quite a ways removed from talking about replacing NAND. There is a very good chance where there will be synergy where other technologies will start working in their own niches. And if something clicks, hey, I really need the performance that this technology offers, or I really need the density that this offers, things could take it from there. And then you have Christian says principle, which will just say, I have this thing, now I'll exploit it to its limit. But in terms of status, there is such a wide chasm between NAND and the rest of the technologies that it's a long time before somebody really, really challenges and starts talking about replacing. I don't think it's... Uh, a near term thing. But yes, the other technologies are very exciting. They each get something unique to the table. And they have to find their own niche, get foothold, grow, and then we can talk about replacement.